good evening. Welcome to In His Will. And tonight we have my very first special guest. I'm so glad to have him on as my very first guest on In His Will, Ron Ray from Mother and Refuge of the End Times. Hi, Ron. Uh, hi, Debbie. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm, th I'm so thrilled that you're here. And I think um, everyone is really going to enjoy what we're going to talk about tonight and um, on saintly stories. Uh, because we're going to talk about the magnificent Saint, Saint Charbel. And um, I've been reading more and more about Saint Charbel. Ron is a, a wealth of knowledge on Saint Charbel and, and has uh, really helped me learn about him and, and uh, uh, just an amazing saint. So, and Ron has really kind of a background and a history. Um, Ron, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background as your Lebanese, yeah. You know, you've got this connection with St. Charbel and... Um... Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I'm uh, my background is Lebanese Maronites. Uh, Maronites are an Eastern Catholic rite. And I've been a Maronite. You know, my parents are Maronite. They came from Lebanon to Australia. And um, we've been, like, basically throughout my childhood, we went to Mass at St. Charbel's Monastery and Parish in Sydney. So it was a very, you know, intimate place, to, a spiritual place for me um, where I got to know about his spirituality and I got to know about, you know, the Maronite and the Lebanese Maronite spirituality. And that, yeah, drew me into um, basically exploring my, my faith and my vocation a bit more. I did go to Lebanon and I, um, you know, I entered the monastery there. And I stayed in the monastery for a few years, discerning my vocation. And uh, yeah, I, I got to learn a lot about Saint Charbel. I got to live um, a bit of his, you know, life in the monastery. Uh, different nowadays than it was <laughs> back in his time. Yeah. But yeah, it was a very, you know, enriching spiritual experience for me. And um, yeah, I, I was able to to find out more about. Saint Chabel and his and his spirituality uh, through that experience. Well, it, it, Saint Chabel is an amazing saint, and actually, uh, you know what I've read and uh, what, what we've talked about is this this enormous enormous number of miracles that are associated with uh, Saint Chabel, and he's known as the miracle monk. Um, because there yeah. are so many miracles with St. Charbel and amazing miracles. Um, uh, I've seen some of the pictures. I've seen some of the things. And he was in a monastery um, in Lebanon that was really this huge, huge monastery that of Christian nations, Lebanon, I, I mean, of, of Middle East. Middle Eastern nations, yeah. Lebanon has the largest population of Christians. Yeah, that's right. So Lebanon, um, just to give you some context, Lebanon has um, it originally had a majority of Christians back in probably, you know, the early 1900s or mid-1900s. And um, so the Christians in Lebanon are diverse. There's a large population of Catholic Maronites. So Maronites have always been considered to be Catholic and part of the Roman Catholic Church in terms of their following of the Pope. And they, they go back to probably the 5th century. So that it's a very ancient church and the church is founded on um, the Syriac liturgy. So it's considered part of the Antioch Church. And as we know from the Bible, that was one of the first churches that was, um, and that's the, one of the churches that was, um, that the word, you know, Christians, the followers of Jesus were called Christians in the Antioch church. So it has a very strong and long history and a long history of persecution as well. So a lot of the Maronites did move to the mountains of Lebanon and mainly the north, north of Lebanon where there's beautiful mountains and valley systems called the mountain of Kadisha, which is a Syriac word for holy, the holy valley. Is this so where you, like, the big monastery is built? This is this yeah, place? so there are a lot of <laughs> monasteries in Lebanon. There's so many. Um, but, yeah, in that holy valley, it's it's just like, you know, a piece of heaven on earth, and it's so beautiful. And that's where St. Charbel grew up. 
So that's where my background is as well. It's in a, it's not too far from the actual village of where uh, Saint Charbel was from. So he's fr he's from a village called Bar Kafra, and that's probably like um, it's probably you could say ten kilometers uh, from where where my village is. So it's yeah, it's quite close, and uh, they're both on the mountains, the North Mountains of Lebanon. And that's where he grew up, and he grew up as basically almost an orphan. His dad died. His dad died before he was even born. So he was brought up a lot by his uncles and his stepdad as well. Um, his mother and his family were extremely devout. So he had a very holy family. He had two uncles that were monks, and they had a strong influence on him. So from his mother's side, his two uncles were monks. And they were part of the monastery there in Lebanon as well. But he was, um, you know, he had a simple life and he took care of the cow. He, he inherited one cow from his dad. <laughs> I heard stories about the cow. Yeah, yeah. So he was faithful to his mission and um, his mission was to, to basically take care of the cow and to take care of the cattle um, that his parents owned. They were a, poor, a very poor family, but they lived, they had a piece of land in the mountains of Lebanon, and he would go and, um, you know, make sure that the cow or well, the sheep I or whatever think, he had. I think to put it in context, you know, the cow, and I heard uh, someone talking about St. Charbel and the cow, and mm. they actually kind of compared it to St. Faustina, uh, because Faustina also took care of the family cow. They had one cow. Oh, and, there you go. When she wanted to become a nun, her father was like bereft because, you know, no, you can't leave because you have to take care of the cow. If you're not here to take care of the cow, we have to give up the cow when we need the cow to live. So, but when you're talking <laughs> very, very poor. Really yes, exactly. A farm animal like that is a precious. Cow. Yeah. Ah, oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And, so, and he was he was such a diligent worker that his mother didn't really want him to. So he was eighteen when he went to the monastery. Obviously, we're summarizing and just taking snippets of his life. But his mother probably went to to the monastery to take him back home, like on many <laughs> occasions, like twenty occasions, where he she would just try to drag him back home, and he would just never. Never want to what, what go, so he would just yeah. refuse. Yes, because yeah, like he was such a you know a diligent worker for his family, and he was able to you know pasture the pasture the the cows and look after the you know the property and the land that they have, and well, his whole life was centered upon the land. So his spirituality was very much centered upon living on the land, and and you know from from his childhood throughout his life he would be you know, very well connected to to the land and to taking care of the land, animals or gardening or whatever it may be. And, and very humble. And I understand that in the monastery, he he was a very, um, lead, led a very ascetic life, slept on oh. a hard, hard pallet, hard board, slept on yeah. board, um, did the most menial of work. Sure. Um, and... Um, was very very quiet and these pictures that you see of saint charbel um you see him he's always his eyes are always cast downward uh, and this was just a sign of his humility i think is that you know he was either um someone described it as either he was looking down or he was looking up to heaven he wasn't you know mm. he wasn't really interested in what was going on in really on this plane in this world he was either head bowed and probably, um, you know, a walking yeah. with and um, uh, so his his um, fellow monks really didn't know what, whether at the beginning, I guess, initially, until he actually proved himself through a lot of miracles and through his just his sanctity. But they they were just confused, you know. They thought, "Oh, is this guy for real? Or is this guy actually dumb? Or you know, what what's his story?" Because he would just always cast his head down on the floor. He wouldn't give anyone eye contact. He would look like, you know, just a beggar or a pauper, you know. And yeah, yeah. The the, the, uh, the other monks were kind of a little bit leery of him a little bit or, you know, yeah. thought he was maybe a little weird. 
<laughs> oh, definitely. But yeah, yeah, so he was he was extremely poor, and he he just loved that that virtue of poverty. And um, probably you could summarize him with those three three um, monastic vows that he took: poverty, obedience, and chastity. And he lived those three vows out like you know to a to a hundred percent or one hundred twenty percent, if that's possible. And he was compared, um, you know, to a moon um, among stars. So that's how bright he was. So compared to other hermits, like hermits in the religious order in Lebanon, they would only choose, you know, the really holy and devout monks to be hermits. And, you know, it's a very difficult ascetic life. So it's not that everyone can do that. But he, compared to other hermits, they would say he was like a a moon among stars. So... If you can think of that comparison, like, you know, there was very holy people that were hermits and he was like just way above them spiritually. It so took, It took a while for them to let him be a hermit, didn't it? He, he stayed in yeah. in the monastery with the other monks for quite sure. a time before. And maybe was that, um, you know, you've you've experienced monastery. Is, mm. is that typical that, you know, somebody just doesn't enter the monastery and then become a hermit? Oh, definitely, you know, yeah. You know, increase in holiness and and spend your life really preparing for that yeah. kind of really um, well, solitude, uh, solid, yeah. uh, solitude. Solitude, yeah. 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 Well, that's exactly right. Well, um, a lot of people said, like a lot of the eyewitnesses and his fellow brother monks and so on, said that he didn't really make a big transition when he entered into the monastery because he was when he entered into the hermitage because he was already living that kind of life even in the monastery amongst you know the community the religious community he would prefer like the solitude and you know the quietness and he would try to shy away from people and not even want to talk so his his words were very very low, very minimal and he would just prefer living, a, you know, a life of solitude. But he was just, up, he showed the utmost respect and love towards his brothers and sisters. And especially if you read the eyewitness accounts, um, he he was just, you know, everything was based on the will and the orders of his superiors. So his whole life, he spent his whole life trying to deny his will. And it's interesting that you talk about you know, your channel in his will, like his whole life was just trying to deny his own will. And he would live out his life according to his, the will of his superiors. So this is what we're called to, this is what we're called to, is to live in the will of God completely, to give ourselves completely to God and Mm. to set aside our own will. Of course, I'm a, I'm a student of the divine will, which, which is absolutely about laying aside your own will. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, his miracles because yeah. he was considered possibly one of the most prolific miracle workers in the church. Um, yes, some people, some people think that St. Charbel actually um, um, uh, manifested. There were more miracles from him than any any other saint. And we're talking... Uh, we're not talking just a few documented miracles. We're no. talking about thousands, thousands That's right. of yeah. miracles that are documented um, in Rome. Mm. So, so basically, yeah, his whole life, his whole life, and his whole <laughs> after his life is is all a miracle, and it's just one continuous miracle. To to be honest, he's he's really just an amazing saint, you know. Um, so during his life, obviously, there were a lot of miracles, and that's how he proved his sanctity, really, because, like I said in the beginning, a lot of people were confused, a lot of fellow monks and religious. They were, weren't sure whether he was for real or whether he was just, you know, some kind of a wacko, you know. But, you know, his his um, miracles and the miracles he performed during his life really attested to his sanctity, and uh, it came to a stage basically where he was just well known for miracles and the people, you know, in the village, surrounding villages where he where he lived, uh, you know, where his monastery was, they all knew him as the saint. They already called him a saint before he was, you know, um, before he was ordained, before he was canonized or before he even died. 
he, he was just well known for so many miracles during his life and then after his you know after his death it's as if a whole new chapter like it's as if an escalation occurred a whole new level quite an escalation of, of, I would say. yeah of miracles happen so yeah so during his life you know he the, the miracles you know it, are just so many but a lot of them were related to going and visiting people in nearby towns and all of his miracles were done under obedience so that's what i really want to emphasize that he would never go and do bless like a field he would bless a lot of holy water and sprinkle fields that were um you know had plagues or you know plagues of locusts and plagues that were you know eating up of crops because remember they were a farming community so a lot of the times people will call up his superior and say you know oh, send over saint Sha send over Charbel because we need to get some blessing on our and um he was just so well known that you know people from all different religions would come to him while he was a hermit you know Mm -hmm. asking for his you know to, for his help to bless someone that was sick he was known to you know not only heal the sick but also to raise the dead say during his life wow. not to mention after his death so yeah there were people and there still are people from different religions especially from the muslim you know lebanon is both christian and there's a lot of muslims there but a lot of the muslims will go and ask for his you know intercession and receive so many healings and and favors from Saint Chabel. So, yeah, his life was full of miracles, and uh, all the miracles were done under obedience. So he would need to get his superiors, like it, be ordered by his superior in order to go and visit a sick person. He would never do it without the superior's consent. Well, it's interesting too because I heard this that um, so many people would they would come to the monastery, and then after he was he he became a hermit. They would go to the hermitage and they would, you know, and so he had almost sort of this, this uh, dual life after he became a hermit where he was a hermit, but he was still interacting with people because they would come to him and how many Muslims came to him because mm. they heard of his holiness, yeah. uh, these miraculous uh, events that, that happened. Um, and so were, uh, uh, so, um, entranced by this holiness that that even the muslims would come and see him oh, for, definitely. just just like um uh you know just like uh that people would come to jesus uh there were there were no christians yet when jesus was walking around in jerusalem mm -hmm. or, or judea or wherever he was and people would come to him because they had heard of his great holiness and these miracles and so one of the things i know i heard the story about the lamp um now yeah. This holiness and this this sort of little oddity of Charbel kind of created a little bit of uh, a little bit of friction in the in the monastery, didn't it, with the other monks? Um, yeah. So um, yeah, the story of the lamp. The, the lamp was a, probably a really important symbol in in the life of Saint Charbel because it really um, it really emphasized and confirmed to others that he was he was a lamp he was you know a light in the darkness and he was really a saint so that story was um i think a confirm first of all it happened twice actually i probably even happened more than twice but the first time it happened is before he went to the hermitage so mm -hmm. um he actually had, there were other hermits living in that same hermitage and they wanted him. <laughs> they, so they were asking the spirit, please send Charbel over. We want Charbel just to be, you know, you know, there's usually two or three hermits living together. We need, we need him over here, right? <laughs> we need him over here. We need a few miracles over here, guys. Don't know yeah. all the miracles in the monastery. Anyway, he was new at the monastery and he didn't know of the rule that, um, you know, they weren't allowed to have, I think there were shortages or I don't know exactly, but they weren't allowed to have lamps on at night after a certain time. And, you know, okay. the superior made that order. And when he, you know, he was new, he didn't know about that. He was out in the fields. You know, he spent most of his day just in the fields doing the, you know, the most manual. difficult manual labor. And, you know, it was just, and he, it's as if, you know, his, his energy for doing labor was, 
It was a miracle in itself. Yeah. Like he would maintain that that strong energy of doing hard labor throughout the whole day. And even like people say, oh, it will increase during the day. And he was just, it was obviously, you know, a gift from God. It, it couldn't have possibly come from his own human will. He was blessed and filled with God's spirit. But anyway, yeah, so he came back from a hard day of labor in the fields and he asked, you know, he asked that, you know, can you fill up my my oil lamp so that I could go back, you know, and spend some, finish my prayers for the night because they had their, their prayers, you know, the divine, um, what do they call it? Their, their prayers, their regular prayers that they do. So it was like seven prayers a day that they had to complete as monks, divine office. And anyway, yes, yeah, so they were, they mocked him and they said, oh, don't you know that this is and this and that. And then there was a young boy, a young servant, like he was one of the farmers. He wanted to even mock him even more. So he grabbed, he said, he said to him, oh, give me your lamp and I'll, I'll fill it up for you. So he, he was acting as if he was trying to help him. Ah. And he actually filled it up with water. And then um, he, so St. Charbel went back to his cell and um, it, the lamp worked. So it was, it was the lamp, you know, um, lit <laughs> yeah. up. That's when the yeah. superior said, that's when they also, let's get this guy out of here, right? Yeah, so yeah. the superior came along yeah. and he saw the lamp, you know, one cell in the whole monastery that was lit up and, you know, it was meant to be all lights off. And he went this, and he rebuked Charbel and he said, oh, why have you, well, you know, why have you disobeyed our orders and blah, blah. And then he said, you know, oh. so St. Charbel didn't make any excuses. He knelt, knelt, fell down on his knees and begged for pardon and apology. But anyway, they found out that, you know, oh, the servant said, oh, we didn't fill his, <laughs> because they would get in trouble as well. Uh -huh. So they said, yeah, because they were workers. And they said, no, 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 we filled it up with water. It was, <laughs> you know, it was a practical joke. <laughs> so, yeah, well, yeah, when the superior, you know, he went, he got the lamp and analysed it, it was water and he was amazed and he just felt that was a sign that, okay, go go off to the <laughs> hermitage. You've, you know, we've got a sign from God that you, you are a saintly person. Yeah. You know, you think about it and uh, we do have a question. I want to get to the question, but you think about it and, when you have someone um, being around someone who really is so holy and those kinds of things start to happen, um, you know, sometimes people get a little, they get a little scared. I mean, they don't know. Yeah. Of course, you're kind of discerning. Is that, is that from God or, you know, but, but this, this guy was, was really, really holy. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Lala asked if you have loved ones, who are living in a lifestyle that is not chaste, is Saint Charbel a good saint to pray to for the miracle of conversion and leaving such a lifetime? I can tell you from what I've read, Saint Charbel is a good saint to pray to for anything. Yeah. Um, and especially because he lived that, you know, the virtue of chastity. So, you know, like I said, 150% in his life, he was like the ideal monk for living out the, the vows of the monastic life. So, yeah, definitely. So that's one of the reasons, you know, he would just avoid any contact with women. It wasn't because he didn't love women, but, you know, um, you know, as, you know, sisters in Christ. But he would just try to avoid anything that could possibly, you know, um, take away from thoughts of God, you know, and he would just cast his head down completely and never even look up. And he would, especially if women were around, and he would just cover his face with his with his hood and his eyes. And so, a lot of the times, people would never have seen his face, you know, until after he died. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, he'll be definitely a great a great saint to pray for. He was, for very, the, prudent. He was, he was yeah. very prudent with his vows, wasn't he? He was very, very um, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, really guarded his vows sure. of, yeah, definitely. Of, of poverty and he said you know that he struggled with um uh he he had his struggles but he he was consistently and persistently uh guarding his his mm. vows and his his commitment to god to live this chaste uh life of poverty 
and um, yes. you have yeah. I, I you have a, a visual for us here, uh, I believe, of some of the um, miracles. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you can see it because it's in the background. But what I'll do, I'll just put it up on. Let me see if I. Oh no, that's the picture. These are this is a website that I found, and it's got some pictures. That picture there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh -huh. but that's a miraculous picture. Um, the story behind that picture, and it's in the background of, of our screen as well. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the story of that picture. It's related to um, the one right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a relative of mine who lives in um, who was lives in the village where my family come from in Lebanon. So they came to to visit Saint Charbel in um, in his hometown and asked for you know a, a miracle of healing. He had cancer, and when they were at the monastery there, they took the picture and he appeared. And then he went back home to I think he lived somewhere in South America or something. But when he came back home, he was healed from his cancer. And then they they realized that this picture that Saint Charbel appeared in that picture. And yeah, so that's uh, one well, of the miracles. Charbel had died. Yeah, but this was after he died. Yeah, 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 yeah long so after. It was an apparition, and he appeared in that picture. And I, I think the story there's a bit more, but I'm just giving you like a summary of what happened. And so that picture there is. Let me click on it, and you can probably see it in a bit more detail. In, in many ways, he kind of, you know, it, I think there's many similarities and people see many similarities between him and, and Padre Pio. Um, yeah, yeah. And their holiness and. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, their, their um, miracles and. Um, and, their, and their love for the Eucharist and the Mass. So while I was reading up, I just want to recommend this book anyway. It's a book called, and I'll share the website, um, Saint Charbel from his contemporaries to our era, and that's a book I actually helped to translate into English while I was living in Lebanon Ooh. in the monastery. And um, I'll put it up on the screen. But the the beauty of this book it just goes over eyewitness accounts, so it's full of eyewitness accounts on Saint Charbel's life and on the miracles that happened after his life after his death. Um, so it's a really good one. And, and the good thing is it's for free. You could download it for free. Wonderful. It's on, um, yeah, let me see if I could add it on to the screen. So, sorry, just bear with me. Yep. So this is the website here. And um, for our listeners, you'll notice too that there are often there's two different spellings of Saint Charbel's name. Um, sometimes it's spelled S H A R B E L, and sometimes it's spelled C H A R B E L. So, yeah. um, do you know do you know the history behind that, or is is that some kind well, of well his his name? Yeah. Uh, just a preference. I think usually it's C H, but I think in America, I think the spelling sometimes they use S H, but Oh, okay. You know, most of the times it's CH, but his name he's named after a first century martyr. And um, the reason why he chose that name is that was one of the, you know, he had there was a little shrine or a little church in his village when he, where he was growing up uh, in his mother's village um, after that saint, after that martyr, Saint Chabel. So he, it's the name of a martyr and he decided to take that name. So his real name was Joseph or Yusuf. And he decided to take the name of Saint Charbel after the martyr, the first century martyr, when when he became a monk. So usually, what happens when they become monks, they get to choose to, you know, another name. As you know, like with a lot of um, religious people, they change their names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he ch yeah. So this is the website. Um, it's it's got the book there available, and you can download it. It's quite a long. Uh, it's like two over two hundred pages. Wow. But it's worth reading because it's it's just 200 pages of eyewitness accounts, so it's really good. And it's got an appendix of the words of St. Charbel, and maybe we'll have a chance later to, to discuss one of the apparitions that he made to a, um, a Lebanese man called Raymond Nader, and he left like 10 really quite long messages 
which were kind of message, spiritual messages of how to really live out our lives. The messages, and they were really incredible, just incredible experiences for this man. And um, uh, uh, yeah, we, I don't know, Ron, we may have to have more than one episode. <laughs> yeah, definitely go into the messages by themselves because they're very powerful. Well, St. Chobel lived to be 70 years old, um, which is kind of really, um, I think he had a stroke. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I think he had a stroke when he was about 70 years old. Um, and considering the hard life that he had, um, actually, um, and the time that he lived, what I'm not sure what year he died. Do you? It was 1898. Okay, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was close to the um, to the turn of the century, and yeah. when he died, tell us what happened. Uh, where do you want me to begin? <laughs> well, you know, when he died, it was. Um, I believe that the first thing that happened was he died on Christmas Eve. Yeah, he did. And so basically, um, yeah, the week before he died like there's a lot of eyewitness accounts of him you know um suffering i think he suffered uh, he didn't actually get the stigmata but he suffered the pains mm -hmm. of christ's passion and especially during the mass and that's how i tried to i uh, said before he's very similar to saint padre pio because padre pio had these really you know felt this real pain and and lived the passion of Christ during the Mass, and, and so did St. Charbel. So he had to, especially during the time, you know, of the raising um, of the chalice and the, the, the host, you know, the pinnacle of the Mass, that he felt, you know, sometimes he had to stop. And that was especially the last, you know, few weeks of his life where he had to stop right in the middle of the Mass because he was just in excruciating pain. <laughs> they had to physically, like the monks, the hermits that were celebrating the Mass with him, they had to physically pull the chalice and Eucharist from his hand, put it down on the altar, get him to sit down and rest, because he, he was just in just immense pain. It was like obviously. a victim soul, almost, yeah, just... Um, oh, he was a victim soul, and he must have been living the passion of Christ during the Mass with, with our mm -hmm. Lord, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, during the last week of his life, there were accounts of two, I don't know if it was two, but it was at least one Eucharistic miracle. So while he was celebrating the Mass, um, you know, there were people from outside, a lot of the public that were watching, you know, he wouldn't. Sometimes he would let, you know, he would let people come into the mass if they were serving, but a lot of the females would have to watch from outside. Anyway, what, there was one lady that had her baby and the baby would cry out, you know, the child, look at this beautiful child. So they, there was an apparition of Jesus as a child while he was celebrating one of his last masses. And, um, and the girl actually saw, started crying. This was a, I don't know how old the, the child was, but she saw the child replace the host during the last, one of the last masses of Saint Charbel, and she saw the child being broken into half. So she said, "Oh, he's cutting." She started crying when she said, "Yeah," you know, she said that, "Oh, he's cutting the child in half," and that's when he was breaking the yeah. Eucharist. So yeah, it was amazing. So that was one of the miracles, and you know that was some of the you know what led up to his death. And like you said, he did die on Christmas Eve. And, um, yeah, his death was, you know, a very painful death, and he did receive this, the last sacraments. A lot of people say that he died while he was um, celebrating the Mass, but I don't think it was actually while he was celebrating the Mass. But, like, the Mass had a big part in his last week, and, like I said, he lived that, that painful passion with Christ mm -hmm. during that last, the last, you know, uh, several times that he did say Mass. So, yeah, so he did die on Christmas Eve. And when he died, you know, his his fellow hermit, Saint, um, he's not a saint, Father Macarius, he just wept. It, it was as if yeah. people say that, oh, you know, this guy was a hermit and he was, you know, hermits quite mortified and, you know, living a life of, you know, ascetic life. And he wept like a baby. He said it was as if, you know, he lived with an angel his whole life. That's how they described it. 
and he has been, you know, stripped away from this, you know, angelic person and this this monk. This, you know, he just wept as if, you know, there was he no left. consoling. There was no consoling him. Well, he came into the monastery at a, a, a pretty young age. Um, oh, he was yeah. there many, many, many years, and because um, yeah. he died at seventy, and uh, but what a grace to die on Christmas Eve. Yeah, and he was his funeral was actually the next day. It was on Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was a very because it was snowing. It, it snows in Lebanon during Christmas, and there was uh, there was really high, you know, some snowfall. So they had to find a way, and they said that it was a miracle in itself to find a way from the Hermitage, which is up on a hill, and the monastery is a bit lower down. So they and the, there was like two meters of snow, and they had to. It was it's probably like a, over a kilometer. Which is like a mile distance from um, from the from the monastery. They had to go down to the monastery to to give him his funeral. That's the tradition. Mm -hmm. So they had to. They got some of the you know neighboring village people to to help them you know clear the path through the snow. Yes, and yeah. they had to. Uh, yeah, and it was it was a pretty difficult trip. It was snowing, and they put him on a stretcher. And they had to walk through the snow to get him to the to the monastery, and where he had a, a beautiful. It was a very simple, you know, funeral. And they had, and then they buried him, and they buried him in the general cemetery where they would bury, you know, the normal, the normal uh, monks. Mm -hmm. But you know, they already knew that he was a special monk. They were all call him saints, and you know. But they said, you know, we we can't bury him in a special place until we get special approval, and you know. The superior said, you know, if he's really a saint, he'll prove himself and, you know, then we'll move him. So they buried him, you know, in the snow. It was a muddy place. It was like a, you know, it was a very, it was winter. So it was full of mud, snow and dirt and, you know, a very humble place. But very wet. Very, very wet. wet. It wasn't the best condition to maintain a body. No. And we all know what happened this, after that. This becomes yeah. significant. Um, this this yeah. wet environment that he was buried in was um, uh, yeah. So it wasn't like I said. It was a place. If it, if it was a normal body, it would probably decay overnight because it was just the worst conditions. But yeah, so forty five days after uh, from the day that that he died to you know forty five days, they would see bright lights over his cemetery at night. You know, there was a, a lot of apparitions and, yeah, and, um, yeah, a lot of miracles that would happen. And the villagers that were living across from the monastery would see the lights and the superior said to them, you know, oh, give us a sign. There wasn't, there weren't telephones back then. So they yeah. said, you know, if when you see the light, just fire a gun in the air. <laughs> so for 45 <laughs> Well, wait, five yeah. nights after his death, there were just guns. <laughs> Every night there were people shooting guns in the air because they were... Well, this this <laughs> light, this, this very... Um, in fact, the light, um, there was a story on Christmas Eve. He went, Well, when he died, or they, they yeah. had him laid out in the church and that this yeah. light actually lit That's up right. around yeah. him and lit up the tabernacle um, yes. where the posts were. Yeah. And that, that there was a priest in there that had come in to pray, you know, over yes. that, whatever. And there was this, uh, this. Uh, yeah, a radiating light. This extraordinary light that happened, started happening right away. And then they yeah. buried him. And then out comes. It continued to happen. Just emanating from where, from the grave. That's right. So, yeah, there were so many miracles of, you know, apparitions, like I said, and light being seen and holy lights and you know the you know the aroma of sanctity as people say you know although his body was you know he was dead like like they could still smell that aroma of you know of someone that's holy so um yeah i would i would like to say that you know he lived his life on earth um you know, as if he was dead, mm -hmm. but after he died, his whole his body had a whole new life. <laughs> like, yeah, he was basically incorrupt. But if you read about what happened to his body, you know, after he died, it's just like a whole new chapter of life. His body was as if still alive. Basically, he was sweating and 
you know, it was oozing out sweat and blood and water for like 70 years. So he had a whole extra, his body had a whole extra life, you know, his life during his lifetime, he, you know, he mortified his body, but during, you know, after his death, his body, you know, he had a whole new life basically. Well, it was preserved supernaturally. And it was 70 years, like, you know, his, he lived for around 70 years and then his body was, you know, incorrupt and as if it was still living for 70 years. Um, until he was finally, you know, buried, and then later, probably in the late seventies, his body finally, you know, corrupted, and he, only his skeleton is now is is now um, left. But during this time that he was incorrupt, um, mm-hmm. with many years that he was incorrupt, <coughs> I believe over forty years he was incorrupt. Yeah, uh, there was some kind of liquid that would sort of yes. include from his body and this is where this this sort of heavenly aroma came from so every time they would yeah. and he was actually exhumed many times so yes. it wasn't like they just you know uh, exhumed him once or twice and said okay he was actually exhumed many times oh, um, yeah. and he kind of kept checking on him um and one of the the real miracles is his body was still very flexible yeah yeah uh, supple to the touch it literally was like he was still alive and yeah. the the they couldn't figure out that it was like blood was still flowing through his veins. yeah it's blood and water it was, it's probably a, an image of the blood and water that you know gushed forth from our lord on the cross but it was just constant that blood and water and they just couldn't they had to actually change his clothes he was like a living person yeah like his his body was but, as but, if a living was, person um, and and all of what they had buried him in, of of course, would be s- soaked with this. Blood. Oh yeah, initially because yeah, initially it was full of dirt and mud, and then they had to you know when they exhumed him the first time, um, and they found that his body was still you know perfect, and there was all this liquid coming out of his body. They had to clean clean him off from the mold and the mud, and. Um, you know, they put him in several places. On many occasions, they would put him on the roof of the monastery because they thought, you know, oh, let's put him out in the sun and maybe he could dry out. Yeah, the, yeah it was like hot That's summer, sure. you know, Middle Eastern weather on the top of a monastery, you know, and it was on top of a mountain as well, so it would be cool air and the blood and water would just never stop. And he was, you know, placed on top of the on the roof of the monastery like this was wasn't like once or twice for a day. It was four yeah. years where they would just leave him out, trying to dry him off because his body would just never stop giving off this liquid, and it was just that's uh, it was a miracle in itself. And then they would use the, a lot of the, you know, the monks and the doctors would just take the, this liquid and give it to their patients for healing, and it would actually cause wow. thousands of thousands of healing wow. healings and. Um, I think it was probably I can't remember the exact year, but they they performed some you know medical surgeries on him after his death, uh-huh. and they at one stage they said okay let's just take out his intestines and his stomach because you know that's probably why there's so much you know water and blood coming out. So the you know the two doctors I think that took it out and they said oh it's as if he was. It's as if a lamb, you know, they, they took out his stomach and intestine. They're saying as if it was a lamb that was newly slaughtered. <laughs> like his his intestines and stomach were just as, you know, fresh as a lamb that was just newly slaughtered. Wow. So, yeah, it's just, and the stories go on and on and on. Like you could, we could talk forever about the stories of his body, his actual body after he died. And it was as if he had a new life, you know, a, a second life. His body had a second life after he died. It was just amazing. It, it, it is amazing. And it's just an amazing um, testament, number one, to um, the holiness, obviously, of St. Chavel, and also to um, uh, the, uh, the miracles associated with him and the graces associated with him that God has really given us this gift of St. Charbel to just, you know, I, I, it's never, it never ceases to amaze 
how um, in, in the many, many ways that God shows us um, his, uh, his sovereignty and his holiness by doing these impossible things, absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm things. And when we talk about it, maybe we'll do this next time, we'll talk about some of these miracles and the messages um, uh, from, um, it was a Jim Nader? Raymond Nader. Ray, yeah. Raymond Nader. Oh, I should remember Raymond Nader. Um, uh, and uh, yeah. messages were absolutely extraordinary. And these miracles that um, happened, uh, and actually, in some, particularly some of the miracles that were used in his canonization, his beatification, and then his yeah. Yeah. extraordinary. And we have pictures. There are pictures of some of the things that that happened with the people who were. I'm thinking of the woman who had the scars on her yeah. neck. This yeah. is an extraordinary yeah. story that we can go into. And, and she uh, also had apparitions and messages. And yeah, that's something complete, a completely different story that we can get into. But a whole other yeah, story. There's, there's, there's just so, so much, much to discuss. Yeah, yeah, there is so much to talk about with St. Charbel. Um, he, it's kind of like Padre Pio. You can't, you know, yeah. actually, you just have a whole channel on uh, St. Oh, Charbel. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> but the, con the know, content never ends with St. Charbel. It never ends yeah. because the, the miracles never end. The miracles are ongoing. And one of the things um, uh, uh, Father Alar had talked about St. Charbel and was saying that one of the things that had really increased exponentially was just in the last three years, how many, um, how many miracles were being reported from St. Charbel. And again, you know, on Mother and Refuge of the End Times, um, for those who are watching, if you didn't see this last night, uh, we had um, uh, Daniel O'Connor on, and we talked about uh, some of the phenomenon that's happening here in these end times. And um, everything just seems to sort of be ramping up. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is another sign of sort of the ramping up of, of Christ giving us this, this, God is giving us this great time of mercy. And he told Faustina, I'm going to send this time of mercy before I come in justice. And so, we really need to be focused and um, uh, build our faith because it's our faith. You know, Jesus said, it's your faith. Your faith has healed you. Um, and so when we have this opportunity of this intercession of the saints, uh, because they are our great intercessors, mm -hmm. they, are, they are spending their heaven intercessing for us. And Definitely. so um, we we want to um, uh, venerate the saints, uh, pray to the saints. And I want to make something else just clear while we're talking about it. We do not worship saints. Catholics do not worship saints. We worship God. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship the saints. We worship Jesus Christ. We worship the Trinity. We worship God. But, yes. but these holy, holy, holy lives and examples that have um, been given to us to uh, for for our good to help us. These these great holy helpers, aren't they, Ron? They're they're yeah. yeah. I just want to make a point there. Um, I was watching a video from Father Mark Gorey and he uh, his video about Saint Chabel, and um, he was mentioning yeah, and he's mentioning how. You know, there's a biblical reference from Saint Elijah, who was after he died, he was in a cave or something, and um, a, a sick person or a dead person was got in touch with his, touched his body and were healed. Mm -hmm. And that's like a, you know, he was saying that how that's a reference of how Catholics believe that relics, you know, through veneration of holy people, can can you know bring about the intervention of God. So yeah, there are, there is biblical reference to that. Yes. And there's many, many examples of it where people have been in contact or um, um, have venerated relics and have been healed of some um, uh, really fantastic um, um, illnesses and uh, mm. diseases, all kinds of um, all, all kinds of problems. Um, so um, we want to we want to kind of. Uh, just uh, maybe again 
summarize um, Saint Charbel's life as he was in the monastery, because I think yep. next we want to we really want to go into what happened after he died and all of the things mm. that happened, because they're just there's a lot <laughs> to get through. A lot to get through, and um, uh, and I would really um, en encourage our viewers to share this video because I think Saint Charbel, which I had never really heard of, uh, I I may have heard of Saint Charbel from you initially, Ron. Um, you know, a couple of years ago when um, uh, mm. in, our, in our work, um, and y you were from Lebanon and. Uh, uh, we were talking one time about a picture that you have of St. Charbel in your home. St. Charbel tends to look rather severe, doesn't he? Yeah. Some yeah. the paintings and some of the things that you see. But the other, the other person, the other saint that really looks severe to me is Padre Pio. Um, uh, you, don't mm -hmm. see, you don't see a whole lot of laughing, smiling pictures of Padre Pio. <laughs> <laughs> he, he looks pretty intense. And I think the same is true for St. Charbel. Uh, yeah. And we've been given these incredible, uh, God only knows, and, and the saints, uh, what kinds of visions and communications and, and blessings and, and extraordinary graces they receive from God that would make you very serious. Um, Definitely. There's yeah. obviously very special graces and um, yeah, singular graces, I guess, and similar to the grace that Our Lady got to yes. you know, the grace of the Immaculate Conception. And I think that, you know, saints, obviously they, they comply and they want to do the will of God, but they are obviously given special graces and for the purpose of being models and examples for us, low, <laughs> us lower <laughs> sinners. <laughs> As lowly, as lowly, yeah, lowly. they're just exactly. struggling along, trying to, you know, trying to make it, you know, as go, <laughs> much less, um, you know, exactly. uh, with the heights that these saints obviously have been elevated to. And um, although we're all called, I, you know, I must say, yes, we're all called yeah. from saints, and anyone in heaven, anyone who's in heaven is a saint. Um, sure. We'll get that clarity. Anyone who is in heaven is a saint. But there are sort of these, I call them super saints. There's these super saints that um, intercede so prolifically and so extraordinarily um, for us here uh, down yeah. on earth. That and, and people would say that, you know, oh, why are you praying to the, like a lot of evangelicals or Protestants, why do you pray to the dead? You know, they're dead, but they're not, they're not dead. They're not dead. They're and St. Shaba, <laughs> yeah, St. Shaba is the best example of that. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, they're they're more alive than ever when they're in heaven. You know, yes. <laughs> heaven is not death; it's yeah, it's life. It's true life. So. It's 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 real life. You know, Jesus. Many many have said that the, this life is is like um, uh, it's like a veil. There's a veil. Mm -hmm. I think I believe Saint Paul said this. You know that it, it is like there's a veil, and we don't see it all, uh, but in yeah. heaven we will. And so, what's really really real is heaven. Uh, we kind of get a little more of a veiled vision sure. of, what, of what life is. So, um, so I'd encourage all my watchers, uh, all our watchers tonight, to to really um, uh, spend more time investigating Saint Charbel. He's certainly a saint worth um, uh, worth knowing about, worth venerating. And we will come back next week and talk more about his miracles um, and what really happened after. Um, uh, Saint Charbel left us, and uh, after he died, and these extraordinary things began to happen. Uh, anything else you want to add, Ron? Before we we um, we uh, finish up? Yeah. So basically, just to summarize, his life on Earth was, you know, I, I feel that it was basically a total denial of himself. Like he spent his whole life denying himself, denying his own will. And then he spent his whole, you know, after his death, he spent eternity, you know, being one of the greatest apostles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, he's, he's a real apostle of our times, you know, and his, you know, his miracles and his, you know, his testimonies after his death were as if, you know, at a, at a level that's, you know, St. Paul level, he's a great apostle. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, let's close with a prayer. Let's uh, let's invoke Saint Charbel. And um, uh, I love what Patty has said here. Um, Patty said, "When I learn about a saint, I really want to hang out with them and ask them stuff." <laughs> and uh, I have to concur, Patty. I really want to hang out with them and ask them stuff because um, <clears throat> this is how we we have this communion of saints, and uh, we are able to 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 talk with them and 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 receive blessings and graces from them as well. So, um, uh, can you you pray with us? Pray for us, Ron. And, Yes, yeah, sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray through the intercession of your holy saint, Shabel, that you too give us the grace to deny, deny ourselves, especially in times of temptations, in times where we choose material things instead of your, your love and your glory. Give us the courage, give us the motivation and the will always to choose you like your holy saint, Saint Shabel. We ask this through our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. We all thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, we will see you. You can join me again on Sunday night. We'll be doing our uh, Know Your Faith and talking about the catechism on Sunday night. But we'll be back next Friday night with Ron. Um, has graciously um, uh, consented to. <laughs> this is this is a little strange for us because it's usually the other way around. Uh, <laughs> we're kind of enjoying this. So, um, uh, and and once again, you know, check out that check out that. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll put the link. I'll yeah. put the link to that website as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we again we thank you all very much, and um, we'll see you next time on in his will.